Hi, AP Chemistry students. This is Mrs. Hansen, and I want to create the quickest video ever to help you with this assignment, page 13 to 16, Analyzing Redox Reactions. Okay, so I hope the little tips I'm going to give you will help you understand what's going on, and then you can complete the rest of the assignment with confidence and with deep understanding. So, let's see. On page 13, all right, so letter B, uh, this question. I just want to make sure you realize how easy it is. It says, which of these are redox reactions? Well, the best trick I can give you is that if you see an element by itself on one side, and then it's in a compound on the other side, re a, reduction, a redox reaction had to have occurred. So the fact that I see iron here, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that, and now iron in a compound, this one is definitely redox. Um, now, same thing with three, because I see elements by themselves. Same thing with four, even though it's on the product side, it's totally fine, element by itself, so it's zero here in a compound here, so redox had to have happened. Same thing with this one, okay? Um, so to go back, the only one that we might wonder about is two, but I've told you guys before that most double replacement reactions, really just ions trading places. So there's no ion charge changes. There's no changes in NO3. It's still NO3 on this side. You can check all the oxidation states to be sure, but this is definitely not redox, okay? So that was a quick tip. It was a good one, right? All right, so continuing on, you've read through, we're looking at funky redox, which means it just doesn't fit one of the other reaction types, and it has stuff like this in it. Now, I know these tables are kind of overwhelming. It's just a resource for you. All I want you to know is that in this box, these are things that want, or I should say have to, be reduced. They have to or want to gain electrons, okay? And when you come across them, you can use this table to help you make predictions about what the funky products might be. All right, now in this box, these are things that want or have to lose electrons. They want to be oxidized. Okay, great. So we'll come back to using this in just a minute. Page 14. Okay, so letter A basically says, well, why are free metals in the box for being oxidized? And it makes total sense because if you look at any metal in its neutral or elemental form, the only thing that it wants to do is lose electrons. Metals lose electrons. So this is a good half reaction, okay? We would never see this happen. We would never see aluminum metal gain three electrons and have a minus three charge. This doesn't happen. Metals never make anions. So therefore, when we go back to this table, that's why free metals are on the oxidized side because they go to metal ions like copper two plus or aluminum three plus. Never make anions. Okay, so that seems easy enough. But then we get into the transition metals. They, as always, behave a little strange. So when you look at the transition metals, of course, um, you pick something like chromium, okay? Um, it's in family one, two, three, four, five, six. So we say it has six valents. Now we know that's not true. You remember anything from electron configurations from way back last year? All transition metals, uh, their electron configuration looks something like this, 4s2, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4. Do you guys remember that at all? You put the noble gas over here. You guys remember that? So I put argon in parentheses. So all noble gases have, I'm sorry, all transition metals have like two valence electrons. Okay, but between the S and the D, there's six electrons there. Those are the electrons that transition metals are able to get rid of. So long story short, we'll come back to electron configurations later on in the year. But when you look at transition metals, if you look at their family number, so chromium's in family six, it's sort of like it has six valence electrons. It will never have an oxidation state greater than a plus six. So you'd never see chromium at a plus seven, okay? And we already talked about the fact that chromium, because it's a metal, it can't gain electrons. So surely you would never see chromium like minus one or minus three, okay? So let, let's just try one more. So going back to the questions, um, this explains letter C. Why um, explain why chromium and the dichromate ion is in the same boat? Well, if you look at the oxidation states, chromium's at a plus six. It can't get any more positive. The only thing that dichromate can do is get reduced. Okay, and if you look at that table, the dichromate ion gets reduced to we find it right here a plus three charge. Okay, and the same thing with the permanganate. Okay, this guy right here, oxidation state. Okay, you got minus two on the oxygen, so it's a minus eight, so it's plus seven. Well, according to the periodic table, manganese is in the seventh family. So the most electrons it could possibly lose is a plus seven. 
So that's why the permanganate ion has no choice. It can't be oxidized. It can't become more positive. The only thing it can do is be reduced. And that would be the common substance it gets reduced to. Okay, so I hope that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, and you can sort of apply the same rules or use that table in the same way when you look at other substances too. So H2O2, well, what's interesting about that is, well, look at that. It's on this table and it's on the oxidation table. It can undergo both, okay? And so in this question, the problem you guys are struggling with, it says white balance cap reactions to show that H2O2 can both be oxidized and it can be reduced. So if I look, use this table to help me, if I look right here under reduction, okay, H2O2 gets reduced to water. That's the basis of my first half reaction, okay? So H2O2 goes to water, minus one going to a minus two. Now you guys can balance it using the half reaction method. So like two O's, but there's only one O here. So I'll put a two in front, right? That whole process, four H's, there's only two on this side. So I'll add two H pluses. See what I mean? We're just balancing that half reaction method. And last but not least, you got to add in those two electrons to balance it out. Okay? So that's one half reaction. Now we look at the other table and we say, well, H2O2 can also be oxidized to O2. That's another half reaction. Okay? So I want you guys to write that out. Okay? So I was getting on you guys because you just weren't following the directions. It says write balance half reactions as part of your answer. Okay, so this one's a pretty easy one to balance. We'll put two H pluses right here and then two electrons. So there you go. Now, just a little side note, a lot of you guys put this as your answer. You kind of combine both those, you basically did combine both those half reactions. Then you got this product and this product. That's fine, totally great. Uh, but this isn't, isn't always what H2O2 does. Sometimes what you'll see is that H2O2 reacts like in the lab we're doing this week with manganate. And we only see this half reaction. And then the other half reaction actually involves permanganate. So that's why this is a little bit limiting. That's what not what I was looking for. Okay. So we're good. We're good. Okay. We can move on. All right. So then we go on to this question and it said, huh, are there some other substances that can both be oxidized and reduced? In other words, they're on both tables. And what might jump out is that the halogens are on there an awful lot. So if you guys take a look, get rid of all this gobbledygook. You see free halogens here on this table, the reduction table, and free halogens, and depending on the conditions, you get some different possible products on the oxidized table, okay? So all I'm asking you to do is, I want you to just basically write out those half reactions. So it said to use chlorine, okay? So for the oxidation, um, it says that, I'm sorry, let me go back. <laughs> Coming, going back up. There we go. Um, for the reduction first. There we go. Um, of course, this is exactly what we thought would happen. Cl2 at oxidation state of zero goes to Cl minus. We're just following the table. Can you guys balance that using the half reaction method? And then oxidation can occur too. So if I take that same exact Cl2 and I pick some conditions. So you now it's going to happen in a basic media. Okay, either dilute or concentrated. Who cares? You pick. I don't care which one you guys pick. I'll go with concentrated. Okay, just because why not? Okay, so if I'm in a concentrated base solution, then I'm going to make ClO3 minus. And a lot of people say, oh, well, chlorine can't have a positive oxidation state. Absolutely, it can. So just take a look. This is a minus six, minus one. Ooh. The minus one overall, so my pen is acting a little funny. I admit to you, that's a minus one. So this is a plus five. Totally fine, okay? Halogens can have po positive oxidation states. So two points. One, can you balance the rest of this half reaction? And number two, so let's talk about chlorine for a second. Chlorine has normal chlorine, has seven valence electrons, right? Because it's in family 17. So what's the maximum number of electrons chlorine can lose? It could lose all the valence. So chlorine can become as positive as a plus seven. And then how negative can it be? So if chlorine has seven valence and it gains one more, it can go all the way up to a minus one oxidation state. So chlorine can exist in all these oxidation states, a plus seven all the way up to a minus one. Okay, good. All right, so you guys can balance these half reactions. And I think there's one more question I wanted to look at. 
So my favorite page is page 15, because these are the type of questions you're going to see. So I hope that you guys go back and make sure you feel real confident about number one and number two. But right now I'm looking at number three. So for number three, I already figured out all the oxidation states. Okay, and hopefully your answers match. And as it turns out, A and D as in dog, these are the only two that are reasonable redox reactions. So what the word reasonable redox reactions mean is that, you know what? You have an oxidation and you have a reduction, okay? So that's why B is not reasonable because you had chromium being reduced and you had lead 2 plus being reduced. You cannot have two reductions and there's no oxidation. That is not a reasonable redox reaction. Uh, same thing with letter C. You look at how the oxidation states are changing. Um, hello, you cannot have two oxidations. So I would say that is not a reasonable redox reaction. Okay, but D, good to go. So this one's an interesting one because we have I minus. It's already as reduced as it can be. Okay, iodine is a halogen like chlorine. It had seven valence, it gained one. It's at a minus one. It cannot become more negative. So therefore, the only option for I minus is that it has to be oxidized. And very reasonable, it got oxidized to I2. That is a great oxidation. But what does that mean for peroxide? We talked about how peroxide could go both ways. That oxygen at a minus one could go to a minus two, but it could also go be oxidized to a zero. But in this case, it had no choice, okay? If this was oxidation, then you absolutely must have a reduction. So that's why the I, I'm sorry, the O, minus one oxidation state got reduced to a O minus two in water, okay? So this is a reasonable re reduction, redox reaction, redox, okay? Go back and do number one and two and make sure that you really agree. And at some point, um, check the written key on Schoology, okay? Um, well, goodness gracious, I'll do one more. So if you guys look at five, this kind of puts everything up together. Um, and we actually sort of talked about it already. Why did I minus have to get oxidized? You can answer that now. So it was at its maximum minus oxidation state. Can't become more negative, okay? You would never see I minus two. So you could explain that, right? And then right here, it says if H2O2 is reacted with something different, there might be a different result. So here's that same H2O2 reacting with permanganate. So it says which element is at its cap and has to be reduced, okay? Well, that's the permanganate ion because permanganate is in this compound at a plus seven. And we talked about the fact that the manganese atom cannot become more positive than a plus seven, so it has to be reduced. So if MnO4 minus is gonna be reduced, okay, according to the table to an Mn plus two, then what has to happen to the O and peroxide, okay? You can't have two reductions, so it can't go to water. So that's why between these two choices, we're going to have to pick O2 because then we have a good oxidation. So you see, you have to have a reduction and it's, it's kind of like there's no other choice for this. So you knew this had to be a reduction. So then you can make a thoughtful prediction as to what your oxidation has to be. Okay. And then, you know, just to give you further observation, if you saw this reaction, of course, what would you see? You would see bubbles. You could test it with the slint maybe and it would read light. So you'd have some observations to support that, hey, this must be the correct reaction, okay? So it's kind of like using context clues and you know one, you can sort of figure out the other. It's like chemistry puzzles, it's kind of fun. So I think that if you use that same sort of thinking, you guys can very confidently finish through page 16 and um, check the key on Schoology. All right, thank you for listening. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.